Hey y'all, it is Scarlett here. You know, my lighting looked better before I started filming and now it looks a little bit dark. Let's see if I can do something about that. Oh look, ring lights, they come in handy. Um, but the only issue is you can see it in my glasses. You can see the reflection in my glasses. Hmm, we'll see. Okay, I'm not really gonna worry about it because guess what? That is not the, the reason we're here today. So I'm just gonna go with it and hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm doing. It's not a big deal. This is a Mask Within Monday video. I'm just putting on a mask and we're gonna talk about the part two of the last Mask With Me Monday that I did in November. I know it's almost a year later and I'm finally getting around to doing part two, but without further ado, I'm gonna start putting on my mask while we're talking. Uh, this is the Freeman Feeling Beautiful. I think they're taking the Freeman part off of their masks now and they're just gonna be called the Feeling Beautiful masks. I'm not really sure why but it is cruelty free. This is the brightening uh, peel off gel mask and it has green tea and orange, what is that? Orange blossom. Yeah. And spoiler alert, I have used this mask before and I do like it. The fragrance is strong around my eyes, but uh, it does make them water a little bit, but you know, I've only used it once. So we're gonna see how it does today. And so I'm gonna start putting it on. And last time I talked about uh, how, you know, trauma affects you and what you can do yourself to cope with trauma. And this time I want to talk, talk about how if you aren't dealing with trauma yourself, or if you're not dealing with trauma at the time and some a loved one is, uh, what you can do to help your loved ones cope with trauma. Because it's not like you can do narrative therapy for a friend. It's You know, you can't really do that. That is something they have to do for themselves. And so here are some things you can do. And the number one thing is just listen, listen. Don't try to tell them about your experiences. Don't try to tell them how they feel. Definitely don't do that. Don't ever try to tell someone who is traumatized how they feel. Let them tell you how they feel. If you need to clarify, it's a good idea to try framing it this way. Repeat back to them what they said to you and then ask them if that's right. This is something they teach us in uh, social work classes. It sounds like you're saying whatever you think they said. Am I understanding that right? And then get confirmation. And that way that the person that you are listening to knows that you're listening. They have confirmation that you are hearing them. And that's really important. It's important for someone who is dealing with trauma to feel heard and to feel like the things that they have to say matter and that their feelings about their trauma are valid. Um, you definitely need validation regarding the way you feel when you've been traumatized because like there are times you know, the world will tell me that I just need to get over it or that I need to move on and get past it and just, you know, whatever. It doesn't work that way. Uh, I get triggered. Everyone gets triggered. And I end up back at square one some days. So it's not, you know, healing is not linear. You have... Uh, good days, you have bad days, you spring forward and you fall back. You have, you know, times when you're fine and, you know, you're not really focused on it. But to be completely honest, I think about it in some small way every day. And uh, by the way, I'm using the Yes To 
uh, mask applying tool. I really love this. It helps me get a an even layer when I'm applying masks and it keeps all the sticky stuff off my hands because I don't really like that. So I'm going to let this dry down. It says, I think you're supposed to leave it on. Y'all, I've been having trouble with my glasses. I can't really see out of them right now. 10 to 15 minutes or until dry. So we'll just see how long it takes to dry and then I'll start peeling it off. And if I get done talking before the mask is dry, so be it. It doesn't really matter. I'll let you know in another video or in the next Mask with Monday uh, how it turned out, what the results were, that kind of thing. Or, or I'll just, you know, film another video letting you know how it turned out once I took it off. It's not really the focus. The mask is not the focus. It's kind of like a, a side issue to what we're really talking about. But uh, listen and repeat and clarify and let your friends or loved ones know that you are hearing them, uh, that you can ask uh, if there is a specific way that you can help, if there's anything that you can do, you can say, what can I do for you uh, right now? Is there something I can do for you right now that will help you? And that is very helpful because it's not, is there anything I can do for you? You don't need to sound like everybody else sounds. You need to sound genuine. You need to find another way to say what anybody else would say. Uh, and that takes me into number two, be genuine. Don't offer platitudes. Uh, one of the worst things that anyone can say to me is, I'm praying for you. I'm like, well, whoop de do. What do I do in the meantime? Because that's all well and good and it's not that I don't appreciate prayer because that's a very kind thing for you to do for me but number one I hope you are actually doing it and not just saying that you're praying for me because it's what you think you should say and number two what can I do practically in the meantime while I'm waiting for God to help me or waiting for him to send somebody to help me or how do you know that you're not the person that God was sending to me to help me and that he didn't want you to do something more than just pray for me. You know, that's not the only thing you can do for people. So be genuine. Don't offer platitudes. Don't say, I'm sorry if you don't mean it. If you like when someone passes away, I, look the person in the eye and I tell them I'm so genuinely sorry that you know this happened to you I'm so sorry for your loss that is terrible and you know I just hope that you know you're able to heal from this soon you know don't don't just say I'm sorry for your loss like say I'm really sorry and I I really hate this for you be genuine. Don't just say the same thing everybody else says. Think about what you say. It matters. It matters that you're genuine. It matters that people think that you actually care. If you don't care, then don't care. But if you actually genuinely care, then act like it. It's important. And, you know, you can tell them that... You know, it, it is hard to help people when you don't know what they're going through or when you haven't been through it yourself. It is. And I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying that this is going to be easy for you to do. I'm not saying that you're even really going to feel like you're helping. It doesn't matter if you feel like you're helping. It matters that you're trying to help because your loved one will appreciate your effort. It's not about visible progress. It's about one day at a time, one moment at a time, just getting through that moment sometimes. So don't think that you can't do anything. Most of the time you can. It's just what you're doing is going to be 
possibly just planting a seed. So just do what you can. Um, you can tell them, I don't know what you're going through. I haven't had that happen to me and I can't imagine what you're dealing with. But I do care that you're dealing with it and I want to be here for you and I want to do what I can for you and mean it. And that comes with number three. Be there. If you say I'm here for you, then fucking be there. And I'm sorry that I'm getting passionate about that. But like, you don't know how many people have said to me, oh, well, I'm here for you. And then you call them and they're not. They're not here. They're off somewhere living their own life because they don't care what's going on with me. Or they have developed sympathy fatigue and they have given up. Like, I haven't healed. I haven't gotten better. So they're just going to go on and live their lives because they don't know what else to do. And that happens. Sympathy fatigue is a real genuine thing. Social workers deal with it all the time. Counselors deal with it. We are only human and we can only handle so much. And that's why there's such a high turnover with counselors and social workers and things like that. It's hard. And, you know, police officers have to deal with it. Firefighters have to deal with it. Anyone who deals with people that are facing trauma is going to... Like, it's, it's difficult, and you're going to become desensitized sometimes to the things that affect other people because you have to. It's a way of protecting yourself, and in those cases, you need people to be there for you. You're now the traumatized party. You've been traumatized by all the trauma you've witnessed, and you now need the help, and it's okay, and it's a good thing to recognize that. You need to recognize when you have sympathy fatigue because if you don't, you are going to say the wrong thing to the wrong person and that is never good. So be aware if you are experiencing sympathy fatigue, you know, if your friend or your loved one needs you, just tell them that you're kind of dealing with your own thing right now. It's better to tell them in an honest way that you're struggling yourself and maybe both of you can help each other than it is to just pretend away your problems and try to be there for them and end up doing the way wrong thing. So just be aware of that and that is important. Be there. And, you know, if you say, call me in the middle of the night, it doesn't matter what time, day or night, call me, answer the phone. Because if you don't, if, if that person reaches out to you and you don't answer the phone or you don't call them back or you don't seem to care, they're not likely to reach out again. They'll just accept that you don't really care or that you're busy or, you know, they'll come up with some reason and they won't reach out and they'll just stay in their little, you know, safe bubble and not reach out. Because a lot of uh, trauma is depression and we isolate ourselves because we're scared of being traumatized again. And I have only recently started reaching out to Cuddle Dragon. I will call him when something's wrong with me. Or if I recognize that something was wrong with me, I'll be like, okay, you know, I understand now why I was behaving that way. Or I'll tell him about something that happened. You know, I don't fear him judging me as much as I used to because we have been together for a year and we've known each other for almost two years. So I feel like we have a good foundation and I know him 
And I do know that he does genuinely care what's going on with me. And that's a good thing. And you need to find a person or you need to be the person that is there for your traumatized loved one. Or you need to, if you can't be that person, then help them find someone who can be. Like help them find a counselor. Help them find a uh, religious person they can talk to. Help them look into ways that they can cope with their trauma. I mean, you can be helpful by bringing up types of things that they can do, coping mechanisms and things. You can do that, but you can't make them use those mechanisms because people are going to cope how they're going to cope. And most of the time, coping mechanisms aren't healthy, at least at first. So, you know, a big thing too is when you're being genuine, don't judge. Do not judge your friends. If they are doing harmful things, the worst thing you can do is tell them how stupid it is to do that or how wrong it is to do that. The best thing you can say is, I wish you wouldn't do that because I don't like that you're hurting yourself or it hurts me that you're hurting yourself, or I hate that you're hurting so much that you feel like you have to physically hurt yourself. Express that, but the worst thing you can try, you can do is try to take their coping mechanism away from them. I have had some very unhealthy coping mechanisms in the past. Um, I have recently figured out that I was still dealing with an unhealthy coping mechanism and I've just recently in the last two weeks started to get that under control and it's been three years since I split up with my ex-partner almost three years so that's scary to me that my physical and mental health are still being affected to that degree that I was still engaging in a very unhealthy coping mechanism due to the abuse that I experienced that I have not experienced in almost three years. So some things linger. It's, it's not like he only abused me for a day. He abused me. He didn't abuse me for five years. He abused me for about three, two to three, two and a half, something like that. And yeah, it's been that same amount of time. It could take me double that amount of time to get over it. It could take me 10 times that amount of time to take over it. I may not ever get over it, okay? I may not. But the thing is, I'm trying. I'm trying every day to be better, to be healthier, and I am. In certain ways, I am seeing progress. And you need to commend your loved ones when you do see the progress that they make when they stop using an unhealthy coping, coping mechanism, when they do start to get it back out in the world, when they open up, when they maybe aren't as depressed or when they seek help for their depression. You know, do that. Uh, be their cheerleader. It's important. Uh, we need, we desperately need support. And that's the best thing that you can do. And when you're supporting someone, don't help them the way that you want to help them. Help them in the way that they need help. You know, some people say, well, what can I do for you? I know, we'll do this. Well, that may not be helpful. Maybe that's what helps you but it may not help your loved one. If you go to that person's house, and this goes back to judgment, if you go back, if you go to that person's house and the dishes are like piled up in the sink, the sink's full of dishes, it hasn't been swept or mopped in weeks, the laundry's piled up, you know, whatever's going on with them, go over, help them. Don't ask them to do it. Go over and start doing it and be like, I'm here to help you. I'm 
I'm going to help you get this under control because, you know, I think you'll feel better if I just get the dishes out of your sink. I think you might feel better if I cook you a meal. I think you might feel better if you take a shower. So, like, you know, maybe tell them, go relax. Maybe bring them over a mask. Bring them over some aromatherapy stuff for the tub. Something like that. And say, you go get in the tub, you go relax. And while you're relaxing, I'm going to make you something to eat. While you're relaxing, I'm going to, you know, do this. I'm going to sweep your floor or, you know, uh, take their animals to the vet or take them to the grocery store. Go to the grocery store with them because when you're traumatized, a lot of times you don't want to go anywhere by yourself. I have times I don't want to go anywhere by myself. I am so paranoid because recently there's a college town 30 minutes away from where I live and it's where I went to college and it was last year and it makes me sick to my stomach to talk about it but three women college age women were abducted in that parking lot and it was one of the grocery stores that I go to and they were abducted one escaped on the way there to where he was taking them out of the car and she went and got the police and told them about it and uh, they were the other two were taken about an hour away they were raped um, and they managed to escape and went and called the police and got help and then he hung himself and I'm a little bit pissed that he hung himself because he avoided justice and they probably didn't feel like they got justice for what happened to them and I and it makes me angry and it hurts me that they're going to have to deal with the trauma of that and their friend is probably like second guessing herself still like should I have stayed with them you know because I didn't help them not be raped uh, you know, by escaping, I didn't prevent them from being raped. And maybe she probably feels some guilt that she got away and didn't have that happen to her. Even the, And I'm sure she's grateful that she didn't have it happen to her. I'm sure her friends are grateful that she didn't have that happen to her. And I'm sure they don't resent that she escaped because she was trying to help them. Just because you're not able to help doesn't mean that your effort was in vain. Effort matters. Trying matters. And the last thing that I want to leave you with is the three most powerful words that I heard when I opened up about being a sexual assault survivor were, I believe you. I can't tell you how much those three words just took a burden off of me because that was one reason why I didn't share it. Or another reason why I didn't share it was not will they believe me because I am a physically challenged woman. I do have a skin disorder. I am overweight. I do have health issues. I was afraid that the reaction would be, well, who would want to assault you? Who would want to rape you? Well, turns out somebody would. Just because someone is different physically it doesn't change their it doesn't change statistics and honestly it's actually easier for me to be overpowered physically and be raped because I can't fight back as well and so I was afraid though that someone would be like well who would want to rape you because 
you're not super attractive. And like, who would want to do that to you? Or rape culture is, is everywhere and it's especially big in the South. What did you do to deserve that? Like, what did you do? What were you wearing? Were you drinking? Um, well, the answers to all of those questions were, I didn't do anything to provoke it, so fuck you. Number two, I was wearing modest clothing um, when uh, several times when my husband, well, not husband, he was my partner, um, when he raped me, I would be wearing pajamas, I would be wearing a dress, I would be wearing clothing. And he'd move it out of the way, because guess what? It moves. It comes off just as well as it comes on. And I was never drinking when any of these things happened. I think I've been drunk maybe two or three times in my life, and it was each time it was by accident, because I just didn't know my tolerance for that kind of alcohol, or I didn't know... Like, my tolerance for alcohol changed when I became diabetic, and I became much more of a featherweight than I was. I was a lightweight before. Now I'm a featherweight, so I can drink half of a wine cooler, and I'm buzzed. So I don't really drink alcohol very often at all. I might have, a, like, half a glass of wine every once in a while. It's not really that great for me in the first place. So I don't really imbibe that much. I don't take prescription drugs illegally. I don't do illegal drugs. I have had a lot of painkillers in my life after surgeries and while having a broken leg. And to be completely honest, I don't really care for them. I don't like not being able to think clearly. And I don't like not being able to control my environment. So I don't really imbibe. Uh, I don't need to escape. Like, <laughs> I'm good, yo. I'm, I'm all right. Um, and so, I was afraid that people would say those things to me that were negative, that would reinforce the blame that I was already putting on myself. Because even though I did nothing to provoke the assault or rape there's still a certain amount of shame and there's still a feeling of, I should have prevented it. But how was I supposed to know it was going to happen? I didn't. I had no clue it was going to happen. I'm not psychic. I can't see the future. I don't know what's going to happen until it happens. So how would I ever prevent that? You can't prevent rape. You can't. Like, unless, unless you, like, you know, disable the rapist somehow with a taser, a weapon, a gun, whatever. Unless while the rape is being attempted, you're able to, you know, take him out somehow or her. Because women rape. You can't really prevent it. You can stop it while it's happening but you can't prevent rape. And also, one thing that I have needed to hear and that I still need to hear years later is, it wasn't your fault. Because it wasn't. It wasn't my fault. It was his fault. He did it. He chose to do that to me. I was victimized by that person. It's not my fault I was victimized. And it's not your fault if you were victimized. I don't know if you're a victim. I don't know. Or I don't know if you're a survivor because you're not a victim anymore. You were victimized, but you survived it. And you're here. And I'm proud of you. I really am. Because if you have not given up and you are seeking out resources to try to cope, you're talking to other people that it's happened to, or you want to hear the stories of other people that it's happened to, you're doing something to combat your trauma 
and I am incredibly proud of you. You are an amazing person for having gotten through this kind of experience. You really are, and don't let anybody ever tell you any different. But it's not your fault, or it wasn't your fault, is very powerful too. And you really need to back that up because I had a friend who listened to me talk about what had happened to me and acted like she believed me. And then when the hashtag Me Too movement came out, she was like, well, she was posting very negative things on Facebook about the women that claimed they had been assaulted or raped. And she was like, surely not all of these women could have had this happen to them or, you know, somebody's got to be lying and why now? And I had told her, I had told her why we don't report. I had told her why we wait to report. I had told her about the shame and the trauma and all of this stuff. And it's like it went in one ear and out the other. And that's not helpful. And we're not friends anymore. Because pretty much everything she had said to me, I felt like it was a lie. So it's important how you react to things too. So don't let, don't believe your friend and then not believe everybody else. But, um, I also wanted to say that, you know, it's good to reinforce to someone that they're not weak because they have been traumatized. You're not weak because something traumatized you. You have zero control over what traumatizes you and what doesn't because trauma is a subconscious reaction to an event. You can't control how you react to trauma, to a traumatic event. You, you can't. You have zero choice in it. So I don't want to be traumatized. Nobody wants to be traumatized. And my mask is actually starting to peel itself off now. So I think I'm going to start peeling it. But nobody wants to be traumatized. Nobody's being traumatized for attention. Nobody, like triggers are a real thing and trigger warnings are a good idea because I have ignored trigger warnings in the past and it has turned out incredibly badly. Um, I have experienced setbacks for weeks uh, regarding my trauma because I ignored trigger warnings regarding TV shows. Um, I don't know if anyone has watched the first season of 13 Reasons Why, but there is rape and it tells you, it warns you before it happens. And like, even now I watched it once. I watched those episodes one time. And even now I'm like re-watching them in my head and being re-traumatized because I can't unsee it. And, you know, I, I really need to pay attention when they, when they say, you know, trigger warning. I need to be like, nope, 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 not today. Not today and not tomorrow either. Tomorrow is not looking good either. So, um, anyway, those are things you can do to support a loved one who has been traumatized. Listen, be genuine, be there when you say you're there. Uh, don't help the way that you want to help. Help the way that they need for you to help. And I'm not really sure that I clarified that very well, but... One thing, uh, an example is like, if they want something done a certain way, and maybe you don't want to do it that way, like, say they're really picky about how their laundry is done, or they're really picky about how their dishes are done, or they're really picky about, you know, cooking, or they, you know, they're on a special diet, or there are things they don't like, whatever. You're not helping if you're doing it the way, in a different way than they want it done. It, like... What's the point in that? And I have run into that a lot, being physically challenged. My parents or my family, like, I know that they don't really want to help me do things sometimes because instead of doing it the way that I want it done 
or the way that I even sometimes need it done because I'm different than they are and I can't reach things the way that they can. Um, my mom has sometimes tried to do things the way that she wants them done and not the way that I need them done or the way that I want them or prefer them done for my needs. And that has caused us to butt heads quite a bit. And I think she's starting to realize now that it's not helpful for her to do that, which is good. My mom and I get along so much better than we used to, which is great. She's medicated now. <laughs> it has really changed things. I'm medicated now. We're all medicated. Uh, Cymbalta works wonders sometimes. And fibromyalgia is the devil. But, um, anyway, I can't tell if that's, I'm going to look in my mirror. Because I can't tell if that's a mask or if that's, like, psoriasis skin. And I think that is psoriasis skin. So, I'm just going to have to take care of that with some moisturizer. But, I got all the mask off. It peeled off. I don't know if you guys saw that or were really paying attention to it. But, it peeled off beautifully. Uh, so, that's great. It didn't leave anything really behind. I'm going to rinse my face after we're done here and, you know, go about my day. But, uh, number four was don't help the way that you want to. Help the way that the person needs you to help. And number five was tell them what they need to hear and not in an insincere way. Not what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. Tell them you believe them. Tell them that it's not their fault. I don't know if you remember uh, or if you've ever seen the scene from Goodwill Hunting where Robin Williams' character tells Matt Damon's character, it's not your fault, repeatedly. He says, it's not your fault. And Will Damon says, I know. You know, and he says it, I remember, he's like, I know, I know. He didn't really know. He said that. He said that he knew, but he didn't, he knew it wasn't his fault, but he didn't believe that it wasn't his fault. And there's a difference between knowing it's not your fault and truly, genuinely believing that it wasn't your fault. Because you still feel the guilt and you still feel the shame if you don't believe that it wasn't your fault. So, anywho, this video has been way too long and I'm really sorry but I felt like it was an important topic and I really wanted to cover all of my bases. I'm sorry if I rambled a little bit. I'm still getting used to doing my videos. I'm still getting used to talking without having feedback and that's hard for me. So just bear with me. I'm working on it and I hope that this video was helpful to you or will be helpful to a loved one of yours. And uh, pick up the Peel Off Gel Mask by Feeling Beautiful. The green tea and orange blossom brightening mask. It's awesome. Um, I'm battling some dark spots here and up here. So that's why I have it. Vitamin C is great for dark spots, as is licorice root. And green tea. Well, the green tea that's in there. Uh, vitamin C, green tea, licorice root. Go check out Dr. Dre. She's awesome. Uh, you should watch her videos. I have learned so much from her. And by the way, doesn't my skin look so much more moisturized than it did before I put that mask on? Okay, that's the last thing I was going to say. I love you all dearly, and I hope that you are well until I see you again. Bye, guys.